Um, can, I better check. Can, can you hear me okay? Am I Amen. Coming? Amen. Very good. Thank you. Amen. Oh, I do hope uh, from the song that we, the hymn that we just sang, um, Beyond the Sacred Page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. I, I hope. I hope this is all of our attitude this evening. And then at the, uh, in verse three, stanza three, it says, show me the truth concealed within thy word. And in thy book revealed, I see the Lord. Oh, it's my prayer that in this uh, brief fellowship, we all would see the Lord. We all would see the Lord in and through his word. Well, um, I want to let you know, uh, there was a, I saw a question in the chat there just now concerning outlines. There, there is no prepared outline for this session, no prepared outline. Actually, for, for the first two sessions of our conference, uh, we, we will just speak from the word, and we've asked the brothers to prepare some, to screen share, we'll watch, we'll look at, read together some of the verses. And then we'll just have fellowship. And then starting tomorrow evening and Lord's Day morning, we will have an outline for, for those two sessions. Actually, one outline covering both of those, those sessions. So um, as a kind of introduction, saints, uh, I'd like to let you know that uh, we could give a, a kind of title to all of our fellowship. Uh, just the, these, uh, these few words, um, watch and be ready. <laughs> watch and be ready. Uh, we're, we're, the first two sessions will be more on this line of watch. And then the last two sessions will be more on how to be ready. And um, I, my, I anticipate that whatever you're thinking about what that may be, it's not going to be that. It's not going to be that. It's going to be a little different than whatever it is that you're thinking. So anyway, tonight we come to the first burden, which is watch. And, and uh, I'd like to start with a few verses. Uh, the first verse, the very first verse that I'd like to present to you is Romans 13, 11. Romans 13, 11. And, and really, it's, uh, I'll ask the brothers to screen share in a moment, not yet, but, but really it's just, it's especially the first part of this verse. And this, knowing the time. And this, knowing the time. Saints, this, this is actually my burden for, for this evening. Knowing the time. Do, do we know the time? Do we know the time that we are living in? Do we recognize? Do we recognize um, uh, where we are in time, in history, so that we can afford the Lord the best cooperation for this particular age? Um, Hey, brothers, could, could you please help us with the, with, with the screen sharing to look at the first few verses? The first few, I think, four sets of verses are, are really related. Um, and I hope that we could, we could uh, read, them, read them together. Um, I don't know who has that. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. Here's, here, here's the verse. Now, wherever we are, we are, wherever we are, let's read together. Let's read together. We're blessed by reading, reading the words. So even if you're home by yourself, you can read out loud. Uh, but oh no, I, I'm not asking you to unmute. I hope you would still mute. Everybody still mute. But wherever you are, read out loud. Yeah. But wherever you are, let's read. Let, let's read at the same time. Amen. And this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to be raised from sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Amen. Knowing the time. Saints, it is already the hour for us to be raised from sleep. I hope 
that through this fellowship, especially today and tomorrow, the, the, the next session, the Lord would use this fellowship to wake up any that are sleeping spiritually, that are sleeping psychologically, that have been, that have been lulled to sleep, possibly lulled to sleep by uh, the God of the age, by maybe the wearing down tactics, just tired, made tired by the events, especially of the last year and a half. It's very possible that all the things have weighed, weighed down on us, that we're just weary inwardly. Do you, do, you, do you know this state? I think we all are familiar with this kind of state where we're just tired within. It's not exactly a physical tiredness, it's a tiredness in our soul, but it affects us physically. It even affects us spiritually. But dear saints, it is the hour to be raised from our sleep. Why? Because our salvation is approaching. Our salvation is nearer than when we believe. And this is not talking about our initial salvation, which is our eternal salvation uh, from the salvation of our spirit. But this is our complete salvation, our complete salvation in spirit and soul and body. It's nearer than when we believe. The next verse or verses. Uh, Matthew. Okay, Matthew and Luke. Matthew 16, verses 2 and 3. But he answered and said to them, when evening falls, you say, there will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and gloomy. The face of the sky, you know how to discern, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. This is the Lord speaking to his to, to the people at that age. You cannot, you cannot discern the signs of the times. Oh, dear saints, I hope we all could have the spiritual insight to discern the signs of the times. Then in Luke, a sister verse to this. You can read with me. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the earth and of the sky. How is it then that you do not know how to discern the time. The call of the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, is to know the time and discern the time. Uh, the next verse, I think this is Second Chronicles. This is a case of First Chronicles, sorry, First Chronicles. Um, um, this is concerning the children of Israel. And, and, and I'll tell you the setting of, of, this, of this verse. This was when, when um, David, who had been anointed previously, but had not in, been instituted as the king, and now was the time for him to become king, not, not only over Judah, but over all of Israel. Then we have this verse, and of the children of Issachar, men who understood the times that they might know what Israel should do. The heads of them were 200 and all their brothers were at their command. It's the middle part of the verse I like to highlight. Men who understood the times that they might know what Israel should do. Okay, thank you, brother. We'll, we'll do the verse, the other verses later. Saints, saints, I hope we all understand the times so that we could know what we should do today. In the time of First Chronicles, the men of Issachar, um, they knew it was time for what? It was time to bring David in as king. That was to bring in the kingship. Dear saints, dear saints, it's time for us to, to bring in the, the, the real David, actually the son of David, the king. It's time to usher in the kingdom age. We are so close. We're, we're today in the church age. We're today in the church age. But uh, it, actually, if, if we were together in, 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 you know, in, in a setting, in, in a meeting hall, 
I think what I'd like to do is to, to draw, the, you know, those uh, at the, in, in the recovery version, in the New, uh, New Testament, if you have the recovery version of the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 5, there's a chart. There's a chart that, that um, has the six circles. And, and uh, that's the, the, the two eternities. The two eternities. Yeah. Are yeah. Circle, yeah? And, then, and then the four circles in the middle are the dispensations. First of the fathers then of the law, then the dispensation of grace, and then the, disp or the dispensation of the church, and then the dispensation of the kingdom. And, and, and if, if we, would, we would have this on the board, I'd show you, I'd show you how, how close we are at, in, at, in the church age, at the end of the church age, to bringing in the kingdom. Oh, dear saints, we're, we're, we are actually, we are actually in the times of, of Daniel chapter 2. You know, in, in Daniel 2, uh, you, you probably you all, all know this story. Uh, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he had a, he had a dream. And, and, of course, he, he, actually, he actually forgot that dream. And then he asked his wise men to interpret the dream for him. And they came and said, they said, Tell us the dream and we'll interpret. He said, no, 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 no. You have to tell me what the dream is and then interpret it for me. And, and they, they couldn't do it. So, so he, he thought, oh, you're trying to cheat me. I'm going to kill all of you. And, and, and then Daniel, I don't know where he was, but he, 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 he comes back and, and he sees this commotion and the anxiety of the wise man there and, and of the counselors. And he said, he says, to the king, give me, give me a little time. Give me a little time. So he gets the brothers. He gets the, the three, his three companions. And they beseech the Lord. And, 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 and then the Lord gives Daniel the interpretation of the dream. And, and you, you, you all know this. It's a, it's a great image. It's a great image. I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it, it, it's, it stood about 90 feet tall, you know. And, and uh and the head was of gold. You, you know this, right? Symbolizing Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and his kingdom. And then uh, the arms here and, and the breast were silver, symbolizing the Medo-Persian Empire. And then, then the, 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 you know, the loins uh, 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 sim symbolize um, you know, the, the Macedonian Empire. And then the legs of iron, which represent the Roman Empire, and then there's the feet, the feet with the with the ten toes, which is which is you know the legs are iron, but the feet are iron mixed with clay, iron mixed with clay. And I'd like to I'd, I'd like to read to you, saints, this this uh, uh, a couple of verses. I didn't ask the brothers to to uh, to prepare this, so I'm just going to read this to you. But, but if you if you're want to, you can take note of this. This is Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, verses 40 to 43. And, and uh, uh, I'll start, our, I'll start with, with uh, uh, 41. I'll read 41. It says, and in that you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom will be, listen to this, the kingdom will be, a confused mass, a confused mass. And, and, and this word confused in our recovery version, we have just a grammatical note that says this word confused means divided, divided. The division brings in confusion. Yeah. But there will be some of the firmness of iron in it, in it, for you saw that the iron mixed with the earthly clay. And as the toes of the feet are partly iron and partly of clay, so some of the kingdom will be strong, but some of it will be fragile. And in that you saw the iron mixed with the earthly clay, they will be mixed together through the seed of men, but they will not cleave to one another, even as iron does not mix with clay. And you know, in the story right after this, there's a stone cut out without hands. 
and that stone smashes the feet of this great image and then it just collapses and then a wind comes and all, you know, all the chaff is just so there's nothing there left and then the stone grows to a great mountain what a what a dream this was what but saints this is a great vision that has much to do with us today because we are, we are at the time of the toes. The toes that are, that are iron and clay. That when you look at the political situation all across the globe, you, you, we, we see this, iron and clay. And it's a confused mass. It's just confusion. It's just confusion and division. Oh, on this earth that now there's so much divisiveness. There's so much divisiveness. And, and saints, we should not have the fantasy that things are going to get better. <laughs> I think it's our hope. Oh, maybe we pray, Lord, Lord, our nation, whether we're praying for, for Canada, for America, for whatever nation we're, we're, we're in. And, and we, we, we desire more peace, peaceful times. And, but, but saints, um, the prophecies are that at the end, in the last days, difficult times will come. That's, that's what the scripture says. That's what the scripture says. And so I tell you, saints, in these days, I have been very uh, impressed uh, with with the what I call what I call the quote unquote the second books, the second books like like uh, Second Timothy, uh, Second Peter, um, Second Thessalonians, and even Second John. You know, we we don't spend as much time. Uh, I think apart from Second Timothy. I don't think the saints spend too much time in the other second books. I, I don't know. May, maybe you're an exception. Maybe you're an exception. But but I know I, I can see Brother Haido there. Brother Haido, if we're sitting in the meeting, I'd ask you, Brother, how much have you gotten into the second books? You know? And and I and I think not not too much, not too much. Where but but first Timothy, oh, first Thessalonians on 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 faith, love, and hope, the structure of the church life, and, and body, soul, and spirit, sanctification, you know, in, in chapter five, a lot of good verses there. First John, we know about fellowship and, and, and the eternal life. But if I ask you, what's in, what's in, uh, oh, oh uh, uh, what's in second Peter? What's in second Thessalonians? What's in second John? I think many of the saints might not be too familiar. So, so I, I, I asked the brothers to prepare a few of these verses as, some, as a kind of example for, for us. So brothers, could you help me again? I think the first verse is 2 Peter, 2 Peter. And actually, we, we spoke about this, this verse in the Memorial Day uh, conference, in the Memorial Day conference. Remember the, the topic of the Memorial Day conference was knowing the truth, being absolute for the truth, and proclaiming the truth in the present evil age. And actually, this was one of the key verses from, from that, that conference. And here we can read this. And many will follow their licentiousness, because of whom the way of the truth will be reviled. Dear saints, aren't we living in an age where the way of the truth is reviled? Where, where, where if we state clearly that we are believers and, we, and we, we take the way of the Bible, God's word, that, that we're mocked, that, that we're old-fashioned, or that we're narrow, uh, uh, um, that this doesn't apply for us today. But saints, we need to know and we need to walk the way of the truth. We need to be constituted with the, the word of God as, as, as the truth. Actually, this same chapter, we, we don't have the verses here, but this is, this is, this is verse 2. In verse 15, it, it has another phrase. 
the straight way. And in verse 21 of the same chapter, it's the way of righteousness. The, the Bible calls the Christian walk by, by certain phrases. It's the way of the truth. It's the straight way. It's the way of righteousness. Oh, dear saints, we must know the truth and walk the way of the truth. The next verse, please. The next verse. We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. Here we have 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Actually, I asked the brothers to, to print out from 1 to 12. But um, here you can see, I, 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 we're not going to read all the verses, but uh, I'll skip through a little bit. But I want you to know the context. Okay. Verse 1 says, now we ask you, brothers, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are gathering together to him. Now you can see the context is the Lord's coming. Can we scroll down to verse uh, seven? To verse seven? Yeah, thank you. For, well, actually, sorry, sorry. Could we, could, could we go back up a, a little bit? Uh, I think maybe to start with uh, uh, verse six. And now you know that which restrains, verse six so that he might be revealed in his own time. Okay, now verse seven. For it is the mystery of lawlessness that is now operating, but only until the one now restraining goes out of the way. You know, saints, this is talking about eventually in the coming verses, the manifestation of the, of the man of lawlessness that believers generally call the Antichrist. And, and it says that, that he won't be revealed until the one who restrains goes out of the way. Hasn't it been in our society in North America that in, in years past, there was more of a restraining on unrighteousness, on lawlessness? But in the, in the last few decades, and particularly in the last few years, there's just more unlawlessness, more unrighteousness. It's, it's more rampant, more expressed, more manifested. It does seem that we are living in the fulfillment of this verse, what, that the one who was restraining is moving out of the way. I, I believe so, saints. Oh, my burden for our children, my burden for our next generation. Oh, uh, th th this gives me more burden for, for uh, uh for the, the, the children of the saints, even the grandchildren of the saints, how we, we have to, we have to put the word of God into them and prepare them how to face this, this age. Okay, can we go down to, to um, 10, verse 10 says, and in all deceit of unrighteousness among those who are perishing, and this is the key phrase, saints, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Oh, saints, we need to receive the love of the truth. And we need to pray for others to receive the love of the truth. It continues. And because of this, God sends to them an operation of error that they might believe the lie so that all who have not believed the truth but have taken pleasure in unrighteousness might be judged. Dear saints, uh, from, from the news, from the media, you can, you can see that, that so many, so many around us, um, in them you can see the operation, what it says here, the operation of error, that they might believe the lie. There, 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 are, there are things, according to God's word, that are truth. But the people of our generation don't receive them. And rather, they believe even the opposite. Let, let's look at the next set of verses, the next verses. I believe this is, uh, OK, from 2 John. Sorry, let's skip over this and go to, go to uh, Isaiah, if we can. Yeah, look at these verses in Isaiah 5 and 29. 
Isaiah 5 says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Is, isn't, this the, isn't this the situation in society today, dear saints? They, they, they call evil good and good evil. What, what from the word of God we would consider darkness, the people crave. What, what we would consider bitter, they call sweet. What, what's sweet to us, they call bitter. And, and Isaiah 29, the first, the first phrase, you turn things upside down. That, that's, that's the situation today. That's the situation today. Actually, I believe we have a, a new children's book. I hope you could have access to it from, from the, the, the website, the Bible tells me so.com is you turn things upside down, upside down, or, or the, the, the title might be upside down. So that it's a, it's a very simple book for, for young children to give parents the, the opportunity to speak to them to prepare them to face this upside down world. I, I, hope, I hope we would take advantage of that, of that material. Oh, dear saints. Uh, okay, that, that's good for now, brother, thank you. We'll go to the rest of the verses later. Do you, I, want, I want you to see saints by looking at these verses, this is really the point, that all of these verses, well, all of these books were written at the latter part of the first century, already in a time of degradation and decline. And all of them were written as a kind of antidote to the believers so that they could withstand the time of degradation and decline. And actually several of these books what they talk about specifically are alluding to today's age, today's age, especially Second Peter and Second Thessalonians. Saints, we are we are at a time, we are at a time that unrighteousness, lawlessness is prevailing, is prevailing. And as much as we pray, and we must pray that that we could live uh, a, a, a tranquil life in godliness and gravity. That's, that's the instruction in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We should pray for those who are in high position. We should pray for the leaders, for the presidents, prime ministers, for the governors, for, for all. We should pray, re regardless of any kind of political affiliation. We should have the view of God's economy. God's economy, that we pray, we pray that the, 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 the situation in our nations would be such that we could preach the gospel and practice the church life. We should pray. We should pray for that. At the same time, we have to know the time. We have to discern the time. That the one who is restraining is moving out of the way. You know, if you look at the notes in 2 Thessalonians about the one who restrains, excuse me, you'll see that uh, it says there, we don't know who that is or what that is. We, we, there's no explanation. But it does seem that that one already started moving out of the way. And that means the man of lawlessness the, the manifestation of the man of lawlessness. It's, it's right around the corner, saints. Now, I'm not here to talk about when or anything like, like, like that or to predict and prophesy anything. That's not my intention at all. My intention is that we would know the time, discern the time, and that we would watch. We would not be those who sleep. We would not be those who sleep. Uh, saints, we're at a very particular time. And the antidote in each one of these verses, in each one of these books, is the truth, the word of God, 
the word of God, how we need to cleave to the word of God, that the word of God would be the truth, the reality to every one of us in every one of our lives. How do we know if the truth is real, is conveying reality to us? Well, firstly, firstly, we should define truth in case we have any that might be newer here uh, among us. Um, I'd like to give you the, the simple definition that actually truth is God himself. Truth is God himself. Truth is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, the triune God. He is the one unique reality in the whole universe. The Lord Jesus, when he came, said, I am the truth, or I am the reality. He said, I am the way and the reality and life. And, and then he said, one was coming, the spirit, another one will be coming, which is the spirit of truth or the spirit of reality. So, so what is really truth? Truth is the reality of God himself conveyed to us through his word, the Bible. Because there's such a verse in John 17, 17 that says, your word is truth. Your word is truth. So, so in order to know what is the truth, we need this book. We need this book. However, it's not just reading the book, understanding the book, and understanding the doctrines. Yes, there are a lot of doctrines, but I tell you, every doctrine, every teaching conveys the reality of God. And, and, and we need to know, we need to know how to contact this book in the way that we get reality. Now, you know, the book itself, the book, the Bible itself comes with a, with, you could say, a, a kind of warning label. <laughs> because in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it, it tells us, it tells us that, that uh, knowledge, the knowledge could kill. The knowledge, the letter kills, it says. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The le what letter? It's talking about the law, the, the Bible itself. The letter kills. Can you imagine? The, this book is a book of life, but it could also be a book of death at the same time. It depends how we receive it, how we receive it. And we have the help how to receive it from these three portions in the scripture. In John, the Lord told us, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So, so when we read the word of God to receive the words that the Lord has spoken to us, we need to what? Receive them in the way of spirit and life. Then, then in <clears throat> Ephesians, <coughs> we're told that the word in chapter 6 actually says, the sword of the spirit, the sword of the spirit, which spirit is the word of God. Receive the sword of the spirit, which spirit is the word of God. And receive it how? By means of all prayer, praying at every time in spirit. So, so the Bible tells us how to receive the Bible. How to receive the Bible in the way of life. By what? Praying with our spirit. Using our spirit. Then, then the sword, the, the word of God becomes a sword. Not not to fight people with, with doctrine, not to hit them over the head and fight with the Bible, with, with this doctrine's right, or this means this, this means that. No, 
It becomes the sword as the spirit to what? To operate in my heart. To work on me. To divide spirit and soul. That's Hebrews chapter 4. The word of God is living and operative and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit. Oh, that we could spend time in the word, maybe in the morning, in quiet time with the Lord and opening our inner being, praying to him. And that one word from the Bible, one word would just pierce our heart and bring the reality of God. Actually, that's what we're going to talk about in the second half of our weekend um, on, on how to be ready. That, that, so I'm going to reserve that fellowship for, for then. But just as an example, how, how, how about, if, how about if, if we're praying the word one day, maybe in the morning, and, and uh, John, maybe it's John, John 1, John 1. And in the beginning was the word. The beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And we're praying that, oh, Lord, thank you, that I'm beginning this day with your word. Lord, I want you to be my beginning. And maybe we'll say, maybe we say something like, like Lord, I want you to be, be the beginning of everything today, the beginning of every conversation, the beginning of every action. And right there, the Lord would touch us. How about yesterday? At the table with your wife, when you started speaking about those saints, uh, and actually probably gossip, was, was I the beginning? Oh, I have to say, oh Lord, no, surely no, surely no. Oh Lord, I want you to be my new beginning. Lord, thank you, I have the blood. Thank you, you cleanse me. And, oh, saints, do you, do you see? Just by prayer, just by following the Spirit, the, the Word could become a sword to, to not, not to fight others, but to fight the enemy within me, within my soul, to divide spirit and soul. And, and then I realized, I realized, wow, that, that wasn't fellowship. That was gossip. Oh, I tell you, uh, that shining could, could actually save me for many, many times the rest of my life. That, just that, that little shining of the word of God. Well, saints, okay, that's, that's the truth. That's what we mean by the truth. The reality of the triune God himself conveyed through the word of God. Now, how do you know that you... That, that you have such experience, I would say there are two principles. From two verses, we see these two verses in John. In John, one verse I already mentioned, John 17, 17. It says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So the word separates us from the world, separates us from the concepts of the world from the trend of the world, and even from the speech of the world, from the speaking of the world, from the speaking of our opinions that are formed by the world, the word will sanctify us. And John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. They shall know the truth, and the truth shall set them free. Saints, if we know the word of God in a real way, we will be free from a host of things, many things. It's possible, it's possible that, that at one time we were bound, we were imprisoned by our temper. But we would be so, we would have such, what, what we would say, a short fuse you know what i mean by that you know when you light when you have maybe a stick of dynamite and you light it but the fuse is only that that little so if you light it boom it goes off right away but if you have a long fuse a long fuse that goes to the other room you can escape damage 
Some of us have a short fuse. How can we, and we don't like it. We don't agree with it. We decided that we're going to overcome that. Did you never decide that? Did you never, never again? Did you ever decide, no, I'm, I'm not going to yell at my kids. I, I heard the message and I, I need to communicate with them. I need to, deep calls to deep, so I need to touch their spirit, touch their conscience. And so, yes, amen. But the next day, maybe that same afternoon, short fuse. Sure. How can we be free from that? Oh, I tell you, the word of God as the truth, the reality. Sometimes, saints, one shining of the truth, one shine of the truth, because, because truth eventually brings light. Truth is actually light. And light is, is actually truth. <laughs> You know, in, in, in the Gospel of John, we see, we see grace and truth. But in the, in the Epistle of John, we see love and light. God is love. Grace brings us to God as love. And truth brings us to God as light. Now, the book of 1 John is a book of fellowship in the eternal life. How can we have these experiences, these living experiences with the Lord, that, that by his word he would shine into us to free us from our, our self-image, to free us from temper, to free us from self-will, to free us from independence, to free us from divisiveness? How? Oh, dear saints, but just by being in the word, enjoying the word, and the word will operate. The word will operate. One shining could deliver us. You know, when, when the word, when, when we're in fellowship with God, uh, and, and I think, I think we, we all know about the cycle in, in, in the first chapter of, of 1 John. Uh, we, have, we have the divine life. And then we have the flowing of the divine life that the Bible calls fellowship. And then, and then that brings us to light. And then in the light, I, I would say there are two categories of things that we see. On one hand, in the light, sometimes we see the Lord. We see something of who he is. And, and it brings us joy. And it would, I, I remember one time I was in the word. I think I may have shared this with you all before. And I met with many of you. I was reading the word. And, and I saw this verse in um, just Psalm, Psalm 3, 3. It says, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. <laughs> my glory and the one who lifts up my head. And I thought, Lord, you're the one that lifts up my head. When I'm, when I'm down, you know, and, you know, when you're kind of down, depressed, usually your head, goes, your head goes down. But do you know what? In the Bible, one of his names is the one who lifts up our head. Praise the Lord. So I saw that in the word, and that brought rejoicing so we can see who the lord is oh these days we're enjoying very much christ as our good land and we need to see the riches of christ he's the weed and the barley he's the vine and the fig tree oh we need a vision of all these aspects of christ one shining one seeing i tell you saints could release you for a week for a week you could just be enjoying oh lord you're you're the vine you're the vine lord you're the barley but the second category of things that we see not just the first is we see christ the other category is we see me <laughs> i don't mean me i mean you i mean ourselves <laughs> we see ourselves 
when the Lord, when the light shines, we're in fellowship with him. With the divine light brings fellowship, fellowship brings light, and, and the light shows me, me, it shows me, oh, what I'm really like. And then what? We confess and praise the Lord, we have the blood. So in 1 John, we have life, the flow of life, fellowship, light, and the blood. And the cleansing of the blood brings us more life for more fellowship, for more light, and more confession, more blood, more life. And we're in a cycle. That's our, that's our experience. That, saints, brings us into reality. That's how we can be set free from a host, host of things. Don't try to be free. Don't try to be free. Enjoy the Bible. Okay, I, I, gave you, I gave you two portions of what I think the word tells us how to enjoy. The Bible tells us how to enjoy the Bible. I told you about John 6. I told you about Ephesians, also 6. So uh, I'm, I, uh, the third one is uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed. All scriptures got breathed and profitable for teaching, for what? Conviction, for correction, for instruction in, in righteousness. Profitable for so many things. But do you see that the conviction, the correction comes out of what? Breathing. Breathing. All scripture has got breathed. Oh, saints, this, this, this book is the embodiment of the breath of God. So we have to read, we have to come to the book inhaling, inhaling what God has exhaled. Not, not, not just with mental understanding, but with an open spirit and open heart. Then what? Truth. Truth. Saints, my, my, my burden in, it, it is that, that we would be, each of us, we would be shepherded into the truth in, in the way of reality so that the church today could be the pillar and base of the truth. First Timothy 3.15. But for every local church, for the church in London to be the pillar of truth, it, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, some of the brothers or oh, the elders, they know the truth. Good enough. No, no, no. All of us have to know the truth for the church to be the pillar and the base of the truth. You know, I was, I was uh, inspired by, by a testimony that I heard recently. Um, but let me give you, let me give you the, 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 this, these verses first. Um, you, you, you might recall that in uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 17, Moses gave this stipulation. Actually, well, I, we should say the Lord gave the people the stipulation through Moses that if they ever request for a king, if they ever request for a king, that king must do what? Every day he should write the scripture. He should write the law every day. And he should read it every day we know we know that did not happen that did not happen because when you read the kings and the chronicles you can see oh what a terrible state israel ended up in with idolatry and division and all that but but the king was supposed to the king was supposed to read the book read the book every every day and and then <clears throat> we know that Joshua you know when when uh, in Joshua chapter 1 before before the crossing into into the good land he he had a, the lord spoke to him he had a transaction with the lord and the lord told him be strong and take courage 
that that's that's uh, um, Joshua one six. And 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 then the Lord told him this in one eight Joshua one eight he says this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall muse upon it day and night. Muse upon it. That means speak it. Maybe reading out loud. Maybe repeating it with meditation. Praying over it. <clears throat> so anyway, <clears throat> there's these two portions. Deuteronomy 17 about the king and, and, and Joshua. About his leading the people into the good land. Anyway, uh, here in New York City, where I serve, a brother went to be with the Lord, elderly brother, a Chinese brother, uh, recently. And uh, his memorial meeting was, was done over, over Zoom. Uh, and and uh, so there were some at the, at the uh, funeral home, but I, I, was, on, I was watching. And... and uh, the meeting was conducted in Chinese with translation into English. So as many saints right now are listening through the interpretation function, I was using the interpretation function for English translation. And it was mentioned <clears throat> that this brother, elderly brother who was saved later in life, that he had copied, he had made himself a copy of the entire Bible he wrote out three times. Do you understand what I mean? That he wrote from Genesis to Malachi, Matthew through Revelation three times. Actually, he didn't finish the third time. He had two complete times and he was in the third. Okay. When I heard this, I thought, wait, no. Um, the, 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 the translator probably got it wrong. I could because my first feeling was I couldn't be that he wrote the whole Bible. And so and so um, I, I waited to see and and then they said it again. And then um, there were testimonies about this. And and then I realized by the fourth time, yes, I, it was not that he was I, I thought maybe I thought maybe that that he had written the verses for the Holy Word for Morning Revival, you know, that, that over and over, or he had written the, his favorite verses or something. But, but saints, this brother had a written, personal written copy of the Bible. Every day he was in the Word. Oh, I cannot tell you the impact of this testimony on my heart. This brother, I never heard him share in a meeting. I was not that close to him. Um, he, he didn't have any English, he, you know, Chinese speaking brother came over to be with his daughter and her family. And uh, his daughter, that couple is very, serve, serves very much with us here. And I would see him in the meetings and just say hello. But saints, oh, I'm inspired by this brother. His love for the word. His love for the word. His entering into the word. Now, I'm not suggesting by this that everyone now make their own copy of the Bible. I'm not saying that. But, but saints, oh, I hope that we would receive the love of the truth and be in the word. Be in the word. <clears throat> this, our future. And, and, and how we can cooperate with the Lord at this time, discerning the time to be ready for his return, will, de will depend on our, each of our relationship with the word of God. Do you know, in 2 Thessalonians 2, the, the man of lawlessness will be defeated by that one who comes with the mighty ones and he will slay him with the breath of his mouth, which means the word of God. In Revelation 19, when the Lord comes with his bride, 
on, on, on his thigh, it's, it says the word of God. That's, that's who defeats the, the Antichrist. Saints, that shows us something. To stand at this time, at this juncture in our lives, where society is, at this point in time of history, we must be grounded in the word of God. We must know the word, be filled with the word, and live out the word. And we didn't read those verses in 2 John that I, I had the brothers prepare, but I skipped over them. Oh, John says, oh, he had no greater joy than to see his children walking in the truth. That's what we need, saints. We need people that walk in the truth and shine the truth in this crooked and perverted generation. Now, the last set of verses I'd like to present is uh, in Judges 2. Uh, brother, could you help us? Brother? Judges 2. And uh, if, if you participated in the recent training on, on uh, uh, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, you might be familiar with, with this. It says, and the people served Jehovah throughout all the days of Joshua and throughout all the days of the elders, whose days extended after Joshua's, and who saw all the great work of Jehovah that he had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Jehovah, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. Verse 10 is what I want to highlight. And all that generation as well were gathered to their fathers, and another generation who did not know Jehovah or the work that he had done for Israel rose up after them. Saints, how could this be what happened in verse 10? Have you ever thought about this? Another generation who did not know Jehovah or the work that he had done for Israel rose up after them. How could we have an entire generation of God's people not know Jehovah? Hey, thank you, brother. <clears throat> Saints, I hope we would consider. Maybe you have considered. <clears throat> First Corinthians tells us, <clears throat> chapter 10 tells us that everything of is that occurs with Israel is a type of us in the New Testament church. And that the things were written were written as examples. And, and, and they, 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 they were written for our admonition unto whom the ends of the ages have come. And I feel, saints, that now we who are at the end of the age, we need to take heed to this portion in Judges, the next generation. What happened to Israel? The word, it's like, it's like the word of God had been passed on, passed on. And there was a, a break in the link. It's like you have a chain, but, but here there's a break. Which, I wonder, have you, have you ever thought, who, whose responsibility was it? Was it the older generation or the younger generation? Did, did the older generation not pass on the, 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 the testimony? Or did the younger generation not receive? It's hard to say. It's hard to say. But we must learn from these things to pass on the truth to the next generation. And I'm so burdened for all the young adults among us, the young working saints, the college students, the young people, the high schoolers even, junior hires. Oh, I hope, I hope you would not be passive receivers of the word of God, of the truth. Older saints, we need, we need to bear our responsibility to pass on the word of God. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says to the parents that the, there's a charge in, in, in Deuteronomy 6 that, that we should speak the word of God, the, speak the law to our children while we're, well, when they rise up, when they lie down, when they're sitting uh, at, at, to, to eat the meals, while we're traveling on the way. It seems that Israel did not practice this. 
did not apply the word that was given to them. And so they lost. They lost. What, and, and they fell in the book of Judges to a situation where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Oh, saints, we cannot have that. We cannot have that, especially now that we're so close to the coming of the Lord. So I want to leave you <laughs> with some verses in Peter tonight. I, I didn't have the brothers prepare this, but I, but I would like to read these verses from, from uh, 2 Peter to you. Verse, starting at verse 12, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. It says, therefore, I will be ready always to remind you concerning these things, even though you know them and have been established in the present truth. Hence, I believe that many among us here tonight, uh, you know the truth and, and actually have been established in the truth. But that didn't stop Peter from speaking a little more and to remind the saints. And he continues in verse 13. And I consider it right, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by a reminder. Saints, it's possible that you have the truth, but your spirit's not burning. Your spirit's not burning. We see that in Revelation 2 and 3, right? That, that they... Laodicea thought that they had everything. They knew everything, but not, it wasn't burning. Peter's burden here was to stir her up by a reminder. Knowing that the putting off of my tabernacle is imminent, even as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, moreover, I will also be diligent that you may be able, after my exodus, to bring these things to mind at all times. So Peter was burdened that after his departure, God's economy would go on. That what happened in Judges would not happen in his time. And, and brothers, this is our burden. This is our burden. We, we need to be stirred up maybe by a reminder. Some of the things we talked about, you might say, oh, we, we heard this already, Brother Ricky, we know this. But still, I find it right to remind you still again. To be in the word. Read the word. Just read the word. Read every day. Pray the word. Muse over the word. So that all of us can be brought to the full knowledge of the truth. So that the church can be the pillar and base of the truth. To be the Lord's testimony in this dark, dark age. Well, brothers, I think maybe I'll just say that much for tonight. And uh, I'll turn the meeting uh, back, back, back to you. Amen.